and arthritis, which is joint swelling, um, should be considered as being symptoms, and they can be symptoms of a whole variety of different diseases. And we have taken a comprehensive history to try and help us, point us in the right direction to get a better understanding of exactly the nature of her joint uh, complaints. And so Janice, um, I think we'll start with the exam, and uh, we'll... Uh I'm going to be examining her mouth, looking for any evidence of ulcers in the mouth or sores. I'm also examining to look at the amount of saliva that she produces because uh, those complaints can all be relative to patients who have joint complaints. We also look in the nose, looking for any evidence of mucosal ulcers as well because the mucous membranes can become ulcerated in a variety of connective tissue diseases. In some patients, those ulcers are painless, and if you don't look for them, the patient is not going to give you a history of any pain there. Just going to feel her hair and see if her hair comes out in my hand, and if we get three hairs on three pulls, that's considered a positive hair pull test, and hair loss is also a feature that we look for. I'm going to be feeling her neck now and her thyroid. And can you possibly swallow for me, Janice? Thank you very much. Feeling for any lymphadenopathy. I'm examining her back, looking for any signs of rashes. I'm also looking at the curvature of her spine. And then we will examine her lungs. Big breath in for me and out, looking at chest expansion again, and out, say 99, 99, 99, 99, 99. big breath in, again, okay, and breathe in. Okay. Right, Janice, could you lie down for me now, please? Back to the abdomen. Let's normal contours. I see no normal, abnormal uh, rashes. We look particularly around the umbilicus for psoriasis, which can give patients arthritis. I'm going to be feeling the abdomen, see if it's soft. Looking for signs of hepatosplenomegaly. Trope space is resonant over there, so there is. Nothing to suggest any splenomegaly, and she has no lymph nodes in the groin. Right. So now we should start looking at the musculoskeletal system itself and uh, examining the contours of the muscles and her leg length looks normal but we will measure that in a little while. I'm going to examine her hip and um, it's very important to put your hand on the pelvis when you're examining the hip because patients can correct for hip abnormalities by accentuating or flattening their lumbar lordosis. So you need to know exactly where the pelvis is so you put your hand on the opposite superior iliac crest and we are going to abduct the hip, and she has a good range of motion with abduction. We're going to flex the hip, and then we're going to externally rotate and internally rotate, and she has no problem with any of those movements. Could I ask you to roll away from me, Janice? Not, don't fall off. Okay, and we bend, bend the hip. That's it. We're going to palpate right over the greater trochanter because some patients can get trochanteric bursitis. If they have a bursitis and you press over the area, that will reproduce pain and it can be exquisitely painful. All right, sweetheart, lie back for me. That's great. Now we'll look at the knees. And you can look at the contour of these knees and they appear to be normal. She has no bulge on the uh, medial aspect of the knees or in the suprapatella pouch. There are no obvious scars. There's no erythema. And so we milk the fluid out of the knee up into the suprapatella pouch. 
to see whether or not she has excess fluid and then we pull the fluid back down into the knee and in a patient who has an effusion you will expect to see a little flicker as the fluid comes back down into the medial compartment of the knee and this patient does not have any evidence of um, an effusion in that knee we will test this knee and I, similarly I do not see an effusion in that knee now we have three compartments in the knee we have the two femoral tibial compartments but we also have the patellofemoral compartment and that of course can give pain that has a separate type of history one of the ways to test that is to press the patella down onto the front of the femur then you can displace the patella and put your fingers round behind the back of the patella to see if that reproduces any pain. And then you can also ask the patient to tighten the quadriceps muscle. And can you do that? That's great. And if they know that's going to hurt, they will not be so keen to tighten the quadriceps muscle. And that is called the patella in apprehension test or inhibition test because they will not pull the patella as, as taut as they would do if the kneecap did not hurt. Then you want to look at the range of the knee, flexion and extension of the knee. You want to test the stability of the knee and you do that by displacing the tibia on the femur, by stabilizing the foot to see whether or not the tibia moves forward. That's called a draw sign and that indicates instability in the cruciate ligaments. Then to test the strength and the stability of the medial and lateral ligaments, you take the leg and I usually rest it under my arm and I try and displace the tibia with my, the ball of my hand while I'm stabilizing the femur. And you can see that in this patient there is no movement of the tibia on the femur there, suggesting that this knee is in fact truly stable. Also feel at the back of the knee to see whether or not there is any swelling there suggestive of a Baker's cyst. If a patient has pain in the knee and you find it to be localized along the midline, you should think maybe of a meniscal tear. The other um, areas that can give pain around the knee are at the insertion of tendons. And you have the insertion of the patella tendon over the anterior tibial tuberosity. And you are going to think very differently about a patient who has pain at the insertion of tendons because that's more consistent with an emphysitis, such as we see in patients who have um, the group of diseases that we call the spondyloarthropathies. Those patients can also have pain over the fibular head because there's another emphasis there. So examination of one joint can actually give you a lot of information. Then we move on down to the ankle. And you remember that the ankle is flexion and extension. So if the patient has pain on that movement, that's true ankle. Inversion and eversion is a subtalar movement and so that suggests if they have pain when you do those movements that in fact that is not true ankle but it's a subtalar pain. Mid tarsal if you twist the foot you can see whether or not that re reproduces pain and then squeezing across the MTPs and you should feel them each individually. Patients very often don't complain of pain in their feet um, uh, but you'll find if you do the squeezing, they will suddenly note that there is pain, and then you can localize that better by actually feeling each of the metatarsal phalangeal joints individually. You should also look at the ball of the foot to see if they have any callosities, which would suggest that they have a prolapsing of the metatarsal heads, which in patients who have diseases like rheumatoid arthritis is very important to identify. The joint capsules get stretched, the metatarsal heads go down to the ground, the toes get displaced dorsally and become what we call cocked up toes. But the problem is if the patient has callosities here, they can actually get ulcers that will develop and that is a potential source of infection and infection is a very important complication of rheumatoid arthritis and in fact one of the factors that shortens lifespan. Never ever forget to examine the toes and the fingers. They give you an awful lot of information. You want to look at the shape of the toes. We sometimes have things that we call sausage digits which means that the digit has no contours. It's just like a fat sausage. And that again is another sign of what we call an enthesopathy. Janice, love, I need you to sit up now. Can you do that for me? 
Um, and what I'd like to do is to start by asking you to put your chin on your chest and then lift your head up. And we are now assessing the range of motion of her cervical spine. I'd like you to drop one ear down to your shoulder and the other side. And then keeping your shoulders where they normally live, try and look at the wall behind you. And we have assessed flexion and extension, lateral flexion and lateral rotation in this particular patient. They all seem to be very appropriate. Then we need to inspect and we need to look at the costochondral joints and also the sternoclavicular joints because those can be involved in uh, some diseases that we deal with. And then looking at the normal contours of the patient's shoulders, you want to see whether or not there's the nice round of the deltoid or whether or not one shoulder is higher than the other. And then we need to assess the range of motion of the shoulders themselves. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to lift your arms all the way up over your head and all the way down. Now I want you to touch your shoulder blades at the back. That's fine. And then to come down. And so we have now assessed abduction and it's important to remember that when a patient abducts their shoulder, the first 90 degrees or so are true glenohumeral movement. It's like a bird flapping its wings. That is true glenohumeral movement. Some patients will come in with pain in the shoulder and it's sometimes difficult to know whether or not it's true shoulder pain or whether or not it's pain referred from elsewhere. One of the places that can refer pain to the shoulder, of course, is the neck. And that's why it's absolutely vital to examine the neck fully because sometimes the patient's shoulder is perfectly fine and yet they have pain in their shoulder which is actually coming from the neck. Pain at the tip of the shoulder can also be caused by irritation of the diaphragm and that's another important reason why you have to do a full examination in patients who have uh, multiple joint complaints. Then we should go and look at the elbow. The elbow is a hinge joint, flexion and extension. The place one might anticipate seeing an, an effusion in an elbow joint is actually um, on this lateral aspect here. And this is in fact bounded by three bony landmarks. There is the olecranon, there is the lateral epicondyle, and then the radial head. And in between those three bony landmarks is where you can actually palpate the joint and where you would expect to see swelling if the patient truly had an effusion of the joint. And that would be where I would put a needle if I was going to aspirate the joint. This elbow has a full range of motion. She does not have a flexion contracture of the elbow here and um, there is no obvious swelling. Other problems around the elbow again relate to muscle insertion and not really to tr true joint disease and we can sometimes see pain in the elbow and when you ask the patient to show you where the pain, the pain is actually over either the medial or lateral epicondyle. The lateral epicondyle is where the extensors of the forearm actually insert and uh, if you press over that area and you can reproduce that pain or you can also get them to extend uh, against resistance and that will reproduce the pain again over the insertion and that is called tennis elbow the equivalent on the medial epicondyle is called golfer's elbow then we should move down and look at the wrists and the hands. Uh, remember that the wrist is quite a complex joint. It's a compound joint, in fact. You want to look at the normal anatomy of the hands and the wrists. In patients who have had long-standing arthritis, they will become more prominent. They are displaced dorsally. And actually, there is a sign called the piano key sign where the arm and the head will bounce up and down inappropriately because um, the tethering to the radius has become uh, lengthened by the inflammation and so the arm and the head can now bounce up and down more than it should. And one of the problems with that is that it is now in the line of the pull of the extensors of the fingers and sometimes it can actually soar through those extensor tendons and the patient will come in and say, I cannot extend my fingers and it's typically the fourth and the fifth finger that are affected by that. You also need to examine and look and see whether or not uh, you can see any obvious uh, swelling, synovial swelling or bursi and ganglia around the wrists. I ask the patients um, to say their prayers 
and then put their elbows up, keeping the hands together, and you can see that she has a pretty good range of motion. Then put the back of the wrist together, and you can see again she has a full range of motion of both of those wrists. Then I ask them to put their hands up, and if the patient has any uh, problems with MCPs or PIPs, you're going to get what we call a cathedral sign, because the patient can't straighten those fingers appropriately. And you can see in this patient that she has nice straight fingers. They are all together. But you should still examine the hands and look very carefully, looking for any evidence of muscle wasting, um, looking for swelling of the MCPs. Normally when we make a fist, there is a dipping in between these MCPs that you can see here and if a patient has swelling of the MCPs that is going to be more prominent and you will go straight across rather than being flattened. Then you need to look at the uh, PIPs and one of the ways to assess whether or not the uh, small joints of the hands are in fact uh, swollen is to actually try and block the fluid backwards and forwards across the, the joint and it should be uh, fairly firm and not spongy. Looking at the DIPs, again you want to examine those carefully. It's very important when you're assessing a patient with arthritis to try and remember the pattern of the joints that are involved. And for example, on the hands, you can get a very good idea of the nature of a patient's arthropathy just by looking at the joints that are involved in the hands. First of all, you do not typically see involvement of the DIPs, the distal interphalangeal joints, in patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes in juvenile disease, but not typically in adult rheumatoid arthritis. If a patient comes in and they have swelling of these distal interphalangeal joints, the, the diseases that I would think of in that patient would be either psoriatic arthritis, which can involve those joints, and typically in those patients they have involved of the nails that are also on the same digit and you can see pitting or actually something we call onchiolysis where the nail gets raised up from the nail bed. Um, other diseases that will cause distal interphalangeal joint involvement are uh, gout um, and of course in the older patient osteoarthritis. It's one of the typical areas that are affected and you can get some knobbly uh, changes over those distal joints and those are called Heberden's nodes. You can also sometimes see some changes in the PIPs which are called Bouchard's nodes. So if you have distal interphalangeal joint involvement that's very important because it makes you think a little bit differently. Then you need to look and see whether or not they have metacarpal phalangeal joint involvement. And one interesting disease that typically produces inflammation in the second and third metacarpal phalangeal joints is hemochromatosis. So if you see just arthritis in those joints, then you're going to be thinking differently about this patient and um, uh, ordering uh, different tests. Then the wrist itself, you need to know whether or not it's the true wrist or whether or not it's the first CMC because this is a very common joint that's affected in degenerative arthritis where the true wrist itself typically is not affected by degenerative arthritis. In fact, the upper limb, of course, is comparatively spared in osteoarthritis. You don't typically see the wrist, the elbow, or the shoulder unless the patient has a job where they do repetitive manual work, but you very classically see the first CMC, the DIPs, and the PIPs. A lot of normal individuals will have what we call Raynaud's disease, where they can have some color changes in their digits. Um, but the, the tissues always go back to normal again, so it's completely reversible. But in a patient who has a connective tissue disease, you may anticipate seeing changes with loss of tufts. Then again, go back to those sausage digits, big, fat, puffy fingers with no nice contours. And if you look at these hands, these fingers have nice contours and nice shapes to them. Um, and so, again, if you see a sausage digit, you're going to be thinking about other pathologies. Then we need to finally assess the, the bottom part of the spine. I'm going to ask you to stand up now so you can for me. And a turn away for me. Thank you very much. We'll get your shoes out of the way. And you need, as I said earlier, to look at the normal contours of the spine. 
many of us will have back pain at some point in our life and so it's very important to assess whether or not that's mechanical back pain or inflammatory back pain and you can get a very good feel for the nature of the pain just by getting a good history from the patient if you think the patient has inflammatory back pain um, and that by that I mean that they have problems sleeping at night, their back hurts when they lie down, they're stiff when they get out of bed in the morning, you need to measure their lumbar excursion and if you look at this patient's back you can see that she has two little dimples right here and these are called Cupid's dimples and what you do is you take a point in the middle of Cupid's dimples and then we measure up 10 centimeters and make another mark with the patient extended. The 10 centimeters in a normal back should have grown to at least 15, suggesting that she does not have significant pathology there. Um, if you could sit down again for me. Then we need to assess um, a variety of um, aspects of her muscular strength. And so uh, in busy clinics, we have a fairly a quick and easy ways to do these. So I'm going to ask you to keep your muscles up and don't let me push them down and put your arms up like this and don't let me pull them down. Push me away, push me away. Spread the fingers wide apart. And we ask her to keep them apart. And I'm testing to see how strong she is. Then I want you to lift this leg up off the bed for me. Come on, fight me, fight me. That's a goal. And this one. Okay. And then pull your heels in towards your bottom. And now push the leg out straight. And this one. And then I'd like you to bring your toes up to your chin. And this one. And this is a quick, easy way of assessing motor power. The other aspects that we need to do is to also look at the way the patient walks. And one of the easiest ways to do this is to look and expect, inspect their shoes and see if there's uneven wear on the shoes because that will give you a lot of information about the patient's gait and uh, hence about their uh, lower limbs and the way they walk. And that is very important when you're assessing patients uh, with arthritis. And um, I think I think we're done. Thank you very much. Okay.